This module will cover experiments revealing the structure of DNA. So a fellow named Maurice Wilkins was able to purify high molecular weight, high quality DNA, which Rosalind Franklin was able to use to make X-ray crystallographs. What she did was to crystallize the DNA molecules and then subject them to X-ray crystallography. Watson and Crick used the data from the X-ray crystallograph to propose the double helix. So let's look at that data. What X-ray crystallography does is it reveals the distances between repeating structures in a crystal. So the DNA was crystallized, and Rosalind Franklin reported out three numbers, 0.34 nanometers, 2 nanometers, and 3.4 nanometers. Watson and Crick, with the help of their understanding of biochemistry and the structure of organic molecules, was able to deduce the following. The 0.34 nanometer structure was the distance between successive bases in a DNA chain. This had been known before Watson and Crick got to it. In fact, it had been known since somewhere in the mid-40s. The two new numbers, 2 nanometers and 3.4 nanometers, were the result of X-ray crystallography of a highly purified, very long-length, finely crystallized molecule of DNA. So this was the novel contribution of Rosalind Franklin. Watson and Crick realized that the 2 nanometer number would be the diameter of a double helix. In other words, it was too large to be the diameter of a helix made with a single strand of DNA and too small in a Goldilocks sort of fashion, too low to be the diameter of a triple helix. So they figured it must be the diameter of two strands placed together. 3.4 nanometers is 10 times 0.34, and Watson and Crick realized that the uh, 3.4 nanometer diameter would be the helical pitch, or the length of one turn of the helix. In other words, 10 bases per turn of the double helix. Now, Watson and Crick also knew that the bases in the DNA molecule would have the potential to form hydrogen bonds. So when they proposed the double helix, they proposed that the hydrogen bonds would form between bases on the inside of the helix and that the phosphodiester linkages, the phosphate component of the bases, would be the backbone. What they didn't know is which bases would H-bond to which, because there were many, many possible pairings of the bases which would allow for hydrogen bonding. But then they read about Erwin Shargaff's study of the base composition of DNAs from different organisms, shown in abbreviated fashion here. The bases, A, C, G, T, are on the, on the left, indicating which are purines and which are pyrimidines. And we're going to look at the base composition just of three of the organisms that Shargaff studied, humans, of course, yeast, and the fruit fly, or Drosophila. And the first thing you see here is that the base composition of these three different organisms is quite different. I don't have E. coli up here, but E. coli's base composition was among the first to actually be studied, and it turns out to be roughly 25% A, 25% C, 25% G, and 25% T. Now, someone looking at that in the absence of this information would have their notion of the simplicity of a DNA molecule confirmed. In other words, there's not much complexity in DNA if there's roughly equal proportions of each of the four bases. Although a big molecule, it could still be very simple in sequence. You know, ACGT, ACGT, ACGT. If you want some variety, it could be ACGT, GCAT, GCAT, ACGT, ATGC, and so on. But equal proportions. So understanding that E. coli was 25% each base didn't give us much additional information. This study said that the DNA composition does not have to consist of equal amounts of all the bases. The DNA was beginning to take on more of a complex structure, an important take-home message from Shargaff's work. Let's take a look, a closer look at this data. Shargaff already knew some relationships, and there they are. The ratio of A to T was always 1, no matter which species you looked at. The ratio of G to C was always 1, and therefore, of course, the ratio of the sum of A and G to the sum of C and T would also be 1. But Shargaff could offer no explanation for these relationships. It may be one reason why, when Watson and Crick and Maurice Wilkins shared the Nobel Prize, Shargaff was not part of that group. Watson and Crick proposed a double helix in which A and T were always paired and G and C were always paired, consistent with the ratios. So Watson and Crick saw what the relationship meant. In this illustration, you can see the significance of the X-ray crystallography numbers. The 2.0 nanometers was the width of the helix. The distance between bases is indeed 0.34 nanometers. And one turn of the helix, or the helical pitch, is 3.4 nanometers. The A, T, and G, C pairs, in fact, fits neatly with the X-ray data. 
G's and C's are held together with three H bonds, A's and T's with two H bonds. I further point out that up and down this helix, a purine is always pairing with a pyrimidine. Purines never pair with purines, and pyrimidines never pair with pyrimidines. If you go look at the structure of purines and pyrimidines, you will see that uh, purines are larger than pyrimidines. So if purines were to pair with purines, and pyrimidines with pyrimidines, as well as purines and pyrimidines, the diameter of the helix would be variable. The width of the helix is always 2.0 nanometers up and down the double helix. It's consistent with Chargaff's data, purines always pair with pyrimidines. Watson and Crick suggested in the double helix the following pairings shown here. They also found from model building that the double helix is anti-parallel, and what I mean by that is when they actually started to build the model out of plumbing, basically, and screws and nuts and bolts, they realized that if they started both chains at their so-called five prime ends, by the time they got to the second pair of pyrimidine and purine, the H-bonds were harder to form because the hydrogens on the nitrogens were further away from the nitrogen or the oxygen they had to H-bond with. And when they put the third nucleotide in their model, they were completely out of sync. When they built the model anti-parallel, starting one strand from its three prime end and the other from its five prime end, the H-bonding was perfect. Here you see the two H-bonds between adenine and thymine, A and T, and the three between G and C shown in ochre, or whatever that color is, is the phosphodiester-linked sugar phosphate backbone. Again, phosphodiester linkages are those linkages that form when you polymerize nucleotides into nucleic acids to create either of the two strands. This is a space-filling model showing the structure of the double helix, the major groove and the minor groove along the length of the helix. All those red components are the phosphates. They're highly charged at neutral pH, so the backbone is negatively charged, and the bases are H-bonding on the insides. This becomes important in understanding how molecules ultimately interact with DNA. The stability of this structure, of course, is due to strength in numbers. It's the number of hydrogen bonds up and down the length of chains with tens of thousands of nucleotides that gives a double helix its tremendous stability.